So Jessica Hester is the Executive Director of Brooks Blossoming Hope for Childhood Cancer Foundation, and she's going to give us our opening. Welcome this morning. And I'll turn the game up on the microphone if you need. Jessica's having a little trouble with her volume of her voice this morning. scratchy voice. I usually don't sound quite so deep. Um, good morning. I wanted to take a moment to introduce you to my special little hero, my daughter, Brooke. And I wanted to start you with one of my favorite quotes. Um, I used to tell it to my students a lot, and it was, uh, nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. And that's a very famous quote by Audrey Hepburn. So I have to tell you, when I was trying to prepare about what to say about the last two and a half years of Brooke's nonstop battle with neuroblastoma to be condensed in a few minutes, I was nervous until I heard someone else uh, speaking of condensing the last 10 years of their work into a short presentation. It's absolutely humbling to be standing before you all in this room today, and as I look out and realize the incredible knowledge, experience, and expertise, I hope that my time to you is as valuable as your time has been to me. Brooke's story is that of faith, love, and lots of hope. And it is not through her struggles, but through her smiles, that I present a brief perspective of her journey here today. In the early years of her life, she was absolutely healthy. And as many neurobuster children are, she was also absolutely brilliant. With a master's background in early childhood and experience testing and placing gifted and talented children in classroom settings, I was very delighted when uh, she had full alphabet recognition by six months, and at a year old, she'd be caught sorting and classifying her bath toys by colors rather than playing with them and knocking them over. Her imagination was as huge as her smile and wild curly brown locks, and we were told by her that her nickname was Buttercup because she loved the wild pink flowers of the spring in South Texas. I remember specifically being impressed once when we were out to eat, and she asked my husband and I if, in a very rhetorical fashion, if we knew what a symbiotic relationship was. <laughs> and I looked at him, and he said, I didn't tell her. So we said, well, what is it, Brooke? And she said, oh, you know, when the fox pecker gets the bugs off the hippo, it was on Go Diego Go yesterday. It's just a sponge. By her third birthday, she delighted in quizzing adults the differences in dinosaur species. There were carnivores, herbivores, omnivores, and her biggest health issue was having ear infections with tubes, and finally her adenoid removal. So things were going great for our little family as we balanced our, our family time and graduate studies and careers. And then one day, in the fall of 2010, I was at a conference when I got a strange message from my husband who said our daughter had a, an odd, painless limp. We attributed it to uh, one little after-school dance lesson she'd had the day before, but when I got home from the conference and the painless limp had become to be painful, we took her to the pediatrician. After many trips, she was given a pre-diagnosis of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and by October of that year, we could not take our family to our family planned trip to Mickey's Not So Spooky Halloween at Disney here because she'd become so crippled she could no longer walk or even crawl across the couch without debilitating pain. This was breakthrough pain right now through uh, a couple of months of inside pain relie relievers that the pediatrician put her on um, while we were on a, a, a Texas waiting list for a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis specialist. Then she began to tell us her belly button hurt in her spine, her belly button in my spine. She was the kind of kid that when she would fall down, she would just get right back up, so we knew she was in intense pain, and we were suspicious that something more was going on. The pediatrician, however, asked us to wait, please, for a specialist for juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and deemed that the stomach pain was from the insects, and put her on acid reflux control medications. 
Her pain grew intolerable and her anemia worsened, and this was not like our rookie, and we persisted with the pediatrician who ultimately agreed to a sonogram, but didn't seem to expect to find anything, but rather to pacify some persistent parents. The sonogram was shady, with a shadowy area next to what they called a mal-rotated kidney. It was deemed a possible kidney stone caused by a potential birth defect of a mal-rotated kidney that was unrelated to the arthritic problem she was having. I still remember in one of my last evening doctoral classes having a conversation with my dissertation chair that I was not convinced these two things were unrelated in our child, and she agreed we should persist for more answers. So on my birthday that year, our three-and-a-half-year-old daughter was given a kidney function test where she had to be awake to have a catheter inserted and was totally hysteric about having to wear a diaper for the test and forced to go on the scan table during the test. And then she was given her first NIVG scan wide awake. And at three and a half years old was amazingly still for the long scan. And this is a picture of her during that scan. A week went by and we still had no answers. We'd never heard of an NIVG scan, so we didn't know what they were looking for. An MRI was scheduled and on November 17th, I left my daughter November 17, 2010, I left her because she was in no shape to be able to go to her private church preschool anymore, so I left her at home with my mother, and I got up for what would unknowingly be my last day of work in my own chosen career path. I had actually not gotten up, gotten dressed for a meeting, and left Brooke with anyone again until yesterday morning for this NMTRC meeting. So I have to admit it was a strange but comforting feeling of normalcy to do this again after so long, and I did it again today. Well, that MRI came back. Um, we took her on November 18, 2010, and that was when the word neuroblastoma came with a shock into our lives, and as you almost know, a thousand times over, our lives forever changed. We were told immediately of the poor prognosis, and the next day, they gave Brooke a full, open abdominal exploratory surgery to take a, a biopsy and confirm the abdominal mass as neuroblastoma. This was done because of her months of insects and there was a high risk of bleeding with a normal biopsy. To this day, I still don't quite understand why that intense 10-hour biopsy surgery was immediately necessary when her bone marrow biopsies were also done to determine that it was indeed neuroblastoma in pathology. That was a Friday, and by Monday she was on the only trial offered by our home hospital, the Phase three standard COG study. I won't go into detail about that first month, but I will tell you that the chemo and the drugs that she was on for hypertension, as the growing mass which had further metastasized post-exploratory surgery or biopsy, squeezed her little aorta causing nearly aneurysm each time she screamed with a blood pressure cuff. I won't show you photos of how the chemo burned her body from the inside out, causing intense pain and suffering, but I will tell you that she started to walk again in a couple of weeks, more like a week, and as her hair fell out, she, her smile began to slowly return. We, as parents, became entirely familiar with the pediatric nephrology team, who disagreed strongly when her high blood pressure began to go down, that the tumor was backing off the kidney, and the oncology team believed that the blood pressure was decreasing because her left kidney had finally died. Ultimately, the pediatric nephrologists were right, so we were, for the first time, feeling uh, quite a bit of hope in the devastation of her situation. All we wanted was our little girl back from what we felt neuroblastoma had stolen from her. Then they brought us in. They told us something we found shocking. Brooke's scans indicated her adrenal mass did not have a 40, a 30, a 20, but only a meager estimated 10% response to her first two cycles of therapy. We had thought she was doing well, walking again, recovering from the massive abdominal surgery, finding smiles again, sharing them already with flower headbands, and her quality of life seemed to be returning with the blood pressure issues resolving, but they told us otherwise. She was not considered to have a good response to chemo, thereby making her prognosis even lower. So we asked what next, and they said, we keep moving forward with the same plan. After her stem cell collection at MD Anderson five hours from home, her next cycle of chemo caused a serious delay in recovery around three weeks, and I got a special invitation, like all of the parents do in our home clinic, 
to be at an unscheduled bone marrow biopsy to hold her hand while the doctor collected marrow and shards of bone with me in the room to determine if she was progressing. That was a very difficult experience for a mother to see and hear. But ultimately, the news was good. She was not progressing, and her marrow results appeared the same or slightly better. Brooke's care continued on the plan toward the standard of care for the stem cell transplant and heartily gave 40 million stem cells in a couple of hours of an apheresis. When the home pediatric urologist surgeon told us he would get what he could when it came time for surgery, it was the first time we began to even consider to seek an alternative. We wanted a surgeon with more experience with neuroblastoma and sought out the incredibly talented yet humble Dr. LaQualia. And in doing so, we as parents had the first realization ever that there were alternative therapies for neuroblastoma that even <coughs> existed. More hope existed beyond what our home hospital could offer. After a surgery a little longer than her initial exploratory one, Dr. LaQualia's side incision was a completely successful resection followed by two days of intubation and watching our swollen child sleep and heal as we prayed for her recovery. During our time in New York City, we also met with the team to learn many cases, just like Brooks did not do well with stem cell transplant and that it was predicted she would come out with one with the same amount of disease, but a higher risk of leukemia. So we decided New York City was much more intense than life at home on our quiet ranch in Texas, and we went home for her sixth and final dose of chemo on the original induction plan and to give us time to make some decisions. Since her diagnosis, we had only spent a handful of days at home, but we desperately wanted only what was best medically for our little girl. During the time back home, both of the regular oncologists went on their own personal vacations and we had a substitute attending from another hospital who knew very little about Brooke's case. So for 21 days post-surgery, she did not eat anything and kept vomiting and only retaining IV fluids and the substitute doctor did not feel comfortable to put her on TPN during neutropenia as a risk of blood infection. She was discharged to go home to celebrate her fourth birthday. And the next day we called and returned to clinic with a very lifeless child who had eyes rolling in the back of her head and potassium levels so low, she required a special, special potassium drip and a heart monitor on her admission. The regular oncologist returned from vacation and told us Brooke's x-rays looked like someone spilled a box of staples inside her body and felt strongly her ongoing vomiting and poor condition was because her kidney that Dr. LaQuaya had saved was failing her due to a dark area at the base of her kidney. But post-surgery, Dr. LaQuaya had met with us and told us about this lower lobe necrosis when he removed an extra artery that the neuroblastoma tumor itself had grown to pump more blood to the <coughs> compressed kidney. Ultimately, the pediatric nephrology team at home advised the kidney perfusion test indicated her kidney was okay. We had one day left before we had planned to try to go back to New York City. Our home oncologists agreed to discharge Brooke despite their strong urgency to remain at home and follow through with the stem cell transplant on the next part of her study. But we went home to spend our first night at home for the first time in weeks and stayed up all night packing to fly to New York City the next morning, May 12, 2011. Before I say much else about Brooke's journey, I want everyone here to think about something thus far in our lives to that point in our child's care. Please think for a moment about what her quality of life was up until that point. For 365 days exactly, Brooke and I remained in New York City. She was tied to one study or another. Most of them were phase one. And we went from open pasture to massive skyscrapers in our temporary backyard. It was a very long way from home. When a two week stay becomes one year, it's a difficult journey. We missed Downey. He visited when he could between work and maintaining medical insurance and our daddy's little girl began to be asymptomatic of her cancer. And although her day-to-day -day quality of life was improving as her neuroblastoma began changing to ganglio neuroblastoma in her bone marrow pathology, it was a long way from home as a separated family. Then came our first month of celebrating September as Pediatric Cancer Awareness Month. And that was really when our foundation ideas began to grow. When Brooke handed one of our primary, one of her primary pediatric oncologists a gold ribbon at the beginning of the month, and the doctor asked, what is this for? 
we realized that more needed to be done to spread the awareness. We were, after all, trapped in New York City. We believe strongly in what Annabeth mentioned yesterday in living with pediatric cancer, and we decided we wanted to be the change we wished to see in the world. So on non-hospital days, and sometimes just on days we didn't feel like going back to the little Ronald McDonald House room of New York City we lived in, we took walks. We went to Central Park, Times Square, Fifth Avenue, anywhere really, and I'd give Brooke a basket of flowers and gold ribbons, and she'd pass them out with these little cards. Brooke had learned also to talk very openly about her lumpies to anyone. She doesn't really have a concept of the word cancer. Her word for it is lumpies which started with a lump in her abdomen, and the child life specialist had given us that word day two. And whenever the lump was removed by Dr. LaCroix, she said, is it all gone? We explained she had a smaller one still in her bones, and so she came up with lumpies. And so there we were in New York City, and she knew the gold ribbon was something special for her, and the other kids that we knew that were fighting lumpies also in the Ronald McDonough house, and through the Candlelighters organization and her own work for cells that wouldn't stop growing where they're not supposed to be. And the formation of her foundation was happening fast as Brooks Blossoms and Buddies back home began to become Brooks Blossoming Hope for Childhood Cancer Awareness. And that even stuck with us in New York City. There we were in a global network of volunteers and supporters and growing, and we found ourselves meeting compassionate celebrities as well as strong advocates for bringing childhood cancer awareness and funding issues to the forefront, rather than looking away um, in pity of a child suffering as if nothing could really help a poor prognosis. Brooke's friends on um, Broadway that, be, that would volunteer at the Ronald McDonald House influenced her very much and influenced her smile and style, and her intelligently creative personality began to blossom. On a non-therapeutic dose of humanized antibodies for six months, with an equivalent of a tiny tube of um, a little Barbie lip gloss, um, we got a surprise in March 2012 she had progressed. Brooks' refractory disease has always been challenging. She progressed with iliac lymph nodes, and we, we didn't know. She had her CT and her MIBG scan, and we found out something was suspicious when we went to, to visit with the doctors about the scan, and the desk told us we had um, a scheduled 2 p.m. spine and brain MRI. The worst was suspected that the spot in her skull had grown into her brain. So that was how I learned what the dura mater was, but that thankfully that was as far as the mass had pressed. It did not get into her brain. In the hospital, she went in with hair and a blossom, and came out only with the blossom. This was her second hair loss, and probably her most difficult of the four. But she kept her smile. So they gave us some ideas for the new plan. Um, they said, we know chemo hasn't really worked well before. Um, we can try ice first. This was on Tuesday. She had her brain and, and spinal MRI. And by Thursday, she started the ice to really stop what they thought might be pushing into her brain. They said it works for some, but we don't know until we try it. Um, it sort of stopped the progression. It didn't clear anything. They said, well, we're going to try my BG therapy now. Um, then you can go home for six weeks. And that was very appealing to us because we had not been home. But we said, well, what then? They said, well, then we'll repeat the MIBG therapy. Well, what then? Well, then you can have kitchen sink chemo. It was a nice reference. Something almost unthinkable as a nickname for therapy for your child. And then they said, well, then possibly after that, maybe in case cell study in between, we would do a stem cell rescue because it's really going to knock her back. And we had these lingering questions. We wanted to know why, why not take out the lymph nodes and send them to be possibly analyzed. We heard of some genomics things going on that we didn't really understand, but we kind of wanted to know more. Well, why if stem cell transplant drugs weren't predicted to work, then why would drugs needing a lighter stem cell rescue be thought to work? If chemo wasn't working for Brooke, what would? Right after ICE and before MIBG therapy, Brooke had her fifth birthday in New York City, and her wish to help others with the blossoms and headbands landed her on the ABC World News. She had the MIBG therapy, and we were sent home for six weeks for the first time in a year. 
finally going home, but full of uncertainty. But we only ended home one week. And that was when we consulted with Dr. Schiller for the first time. After that, the lymph nodes were easily removed by Dr. Deku laparoscopically. There's us leaving New York City. And 10 days later, Brooke's course of therapy forever changed. Molecular guided therapy, individualized targeted therapy, the genomics trial, whatever we had heard it called was irrelevant. For the first time in her refractory years of battling, we had some answers. No more potluck chemo of let's try this and it might work. Let's try that and it's worked for some but not for others. No, we could see in our hands a valid list of possible drugs potentially do what other chemo and drugs had tried to do to turn off pathways supporting Brooks neuroblastoma cells along with radiation therapy to pinpoint the major refractory areas on her scan. As Dr. Craig put it, to try and stop some of those M&M colors of pathways from allowing her neuroblastoma to grow. And thanks to Dr. Scholler's patient-centered care and compassion, last summer, Brooke was doing ballet camp in the morning and radiation therapy in the afternoon, and she loved it. For six months, this worked very well. We took Brooke home for the first time since her November diagnosis, November 2010 diagnosis. This was September 2012. Last September, in October, in November, we had days, even weeks at home, together as a family with a wonderful quality of life all together with our daughter. And that was the first time I really understood the difference between quality of life care and end of life care. When Dr. Scholler said quality of life, I knew it meant something very different. Then in November, our little buttercup progressed. A new lymph node in the armpit. Right before Thanksgiving, what would happen? We cut it out, removed it, analyzed and retargeted. That nice chart that she saw yesterday continued in a cycle pattern and the cycle started over and it was beyond an answered prayer. We felt directly the impact of how important the individualized care was for her, for her case. I wanted to be able to put in a slide here, but I couldn't quite figure out how to do the graphic because something occurred to me last night after I saw the, the slide. I'm gonna go back, you can't peek at that yet. Because when, when we saw the slide with the curative to palliative care, when I thought about the spectrum of our battle with our daughter, it didn't feel like curative to palliative. It feels more like palliative to curative, and then maybe back to palliative to curative. Like it's more of a wavelength going on. And I would really honestly tell you that at the beginning, everything was very palliative because she was in such immense pain. She had been just sitting there progressing with cancer for nearly three months. While the doctors at home were just trying to figure out what it was, what was going on. And so we reached a point of more curative later on, and then as she would progress, we would have some more palliative and then back to more of that quality of life. And so it was it's almost like it's a continuum for us. So I want you to see now, this is um, since last May. This is the past year's quality of life with Brooke. We are coming up at almost a year since we met Dr. Scholler in Michigan. And we had our week in Texas after her MIPG therapy was um, a year ago yesterday. And we were in Texas a week and then we were in Michigan for two cycles and the only reason being is they added radiation therapy to her cycle at the same time because it was entirely convenient <coughs> versus us driving five hours to MD Anderson for RT at home. And then we went back home and then we decided to drive. So it takes us three days to drive to Michigan, drive through Oklahoma, Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana, but not without a stop at grandma's along the way. And then back to Michigan and Texas. And then we, um, she was invited to go out to Paramount Studios with some young youth celebrities and spread pediatric cancer awareness. 
and she did that. So we went through Arizona and California, back to Texas, back to Michigan. And then we went from Michigan to here in January, we stopped in Tennessee and went to Florida for um, the Disney Marathon, which we knew someone who was running for to support pediatric cancer. And that was very exciting for her. It was her, her first time to ever come to Disney, um, which was really a neat thing for her, especially since we had not been able to take her right close to her diagnosis. And then um, we, we flew to Las Vegas, Nevada, thanks to Belle, who surprised, um, surprised us with an award. Uh, for her, it was very special to be called an inspirational hero. And then again, drive, the long drive, I think we made two or three, back and forth to Michigan, and then flying Texas to Michigan. And then we just got back last week from her make a wish to Hawaii. I don't see Dr. Wada this morning. I don't know if he's still here. So it was wonderful to meet him. And then uh, we had one day at home in Texas, and here we are in Florida. And then we're going to be back in Texas for a few weeks and go for scans. And you may look at that and go, wow, there's 14 states highlighted in blue that she's been in for the past year. But I would take that over sitting in the Ronald McDonald House of New York City for a year, any day. We've had so much quality time at home with Daddy, it's unbelievable. She just celebrated her sixth birthday on Saturday in Hawaii, which was a wish come true for her. She's had opportunities to, to spend time with grandparents and great-grandparents that we wouldn't have had. And as a family, our family is now growing. This is our son, he will be here in September. <laughs> and this is just a little glimpse of Brooke at home, jumping on the trampoline, swinging. She loves, you know, we, can, we get the volunteers with the blossoms and everything. So. I wanted to leave you with this quote because I, I, it's hard for me to just describe and express how critical the patient-centered and the family-centered care has been directly to our lives. And in light of the conversations that I had with our home oncologist of palliative versus curative care last week and you know what, what's to come next in her scans in May, and her next path. There's a quote I like from Martin Luther, and it says, even if I knew tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. We have a child who's full of joy, full of life, and we celebrate each and every moment for what it is, because we don't know what the next moment holds in store. But what we do know is that through the molecular guided therapy, we have a whole different level of hope. We feel like there are combinations, like Dr. Schiller is like the locksmith, and she's looking at it with the team and trying to turn tweak those doses and tweak the combinations until we find you know, what, it, what could be for Brooke. And then there are more, more trials and things that are offered beyond that that we have a, a tremendous amount of hope. So Brooke um, couldn't be here this morning. I don't know, it doesn't go to the internet, so I had a little link to her, to a video from her. But if you go to YouTube and put Brooks Blossoms, you'll probably find it, so thank you all very much.